Good morning. To continue our worship this morning, shall we all stand and sing our theme song, That Glorious Day is Coming. That glorious 
God will accept nothing less than unreserved surrender. Half-hearted, sinful Christian can never enter heaven. There they would find no happiness, for they know nothing of the high holy principles that govern the members of the royal family. The true Christian keeps the windows of the soul open heavenward. He lives in fellowship with Christ. His will is conformed to the will of Christ. His highest desire is to become more and more Christian life. Now we are going to pray together. And uh, before we'll be having chance individually to pray, we'll sing together. And then my dear teacher, Mam Pelankas, will open our prayer season. We'll be given three minutes and then our inspirational we'll finish it with in, inspirational song together and followed by by closing prayer again done by mem palancas now all of us are privileged to kneel in the presence of god
O Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, we would like to recognize, Father, that we are sinners and we always fall short of thy glory. Father in heaven, we know that wickedness and faithlessness go on in hand unless we're going to believe that you are able to cleanse us and give us faith and Christ-like love and your Holy Spirit, we have no foundation to build on. At this very point, Father, we are asking for the Holy Spirit to put the desires in our heart and the faith in our mind that once again, Father, you are our God, you are our Creator, but we fall into sin, but you love us so much that you choose to die on the cross for us so that we can be redeemed. Thank you so much, Father. Father, at this point of time, we would like to consecrate our body, our soul, and our spirit. Make us thine, Father, that we will hear your voice, but we cannot hear your voice unless you're going to pour into us the Holy Spirit, Father, to teach us what we really need to pray. We have what we want, but you have your will for us. Once again, Father, we would like to ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to possess our hearts and our minds, to put into the words, Father, what we really need to pray, because you are the one who knows what we really need.
Yes, Father, we are blind because of our sin, but now we, we see because of your saving grace. Father, we are asking for the Holy Spirit that, Father, every day of our life, we will walk closer with you. Because we know, Father, that once our relationship is developed with you, no matter what happens, we will always have the faith that you will never leave us because we have experienced how it is to walk with you. Father in heaven, Lord, we know that with the gift that you have done for us, the victory that you have done in the cross, give us an assurance that this world is not our home and we are just passing through. That while we are walking in this pilgrimage of life, Father, we know that we come to the point that we'll be at the edge of the road. That when the time comes, Father, we know that our faith will be tested. Give us the faith, Father, and when that moment comes, may we remember the words of Moses in Exodus 14, 13, and 14 that says, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you will see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Father in heaven, with the saving grace that you have given us, help us that we will stand still. Because we know, Father, that even though we are at the edge, there is a God that will fly with us until such time we will be caught in the clouds of heaven and celebrate eternal life. Because we know, Father, that you are designed us to be with you in that eternal home. Be with our speaker, Father, as she share your word for us, that we, as we are preparing ourselves for the edge of time, because we know that we will be persecuted, we will be put to death, we will never forget, Father, that there is a God who is always by our side. Thank you so much, Father for the steadfast love that you have given to us because it's always new every morning. Thank you for being there. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. And thank you for the hope of eternal life. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that would dwell in our hearts today as we are going to thy word because we know, Father, that we are asking this. In the loving name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Traveled the routes before, and he knows. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before thy throne not because we are worthy, but we come before thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we acknowledge we are sinners not because we have been doing things which are wrong, but by nature we are sinners and we ask for forgiveness. Lord, we ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ. And we believe in the promises of thy word that if we acknowledge the fact that we are sinners, the Lord is faithful to forgive us. And we thank you, Lord. We praise you. We magnify thy holy and mighty name for Jesus who has come, died, risen, and he lives interceding on our behalf. And that is the reason why we come before thy throne, because we believe that every prayer in the name of Jesus shall be heard, because the Bible does says. So, Father, as we come before thy throne right now, we would like to uplift the name of our beloved pastor, Pastor Sheen. Please, O oh Lord, we beg you that the Holy Spirit may take control of he himself, O oh Lord, and every word that is going to come from his mouth, O oh Lord, may bring life to our lives, O oh Lord, and bring us hope and give us the assurance that if we go out of the cage, Jesus will take control of our lives. Oh Lord, please, I beg that the heavenly angels may fill this house and help us to hear to every single word and to hear to that small voice, to stop, look to where we are heading ourselves, oh Lord, and please, oh Father, hand the Jesus hand so that we can triumph. And as we are living at the end of this world, Father, we may live hopeful and with assurance that Jesus, when comes, we are going with him home, O oh Lord. Amen. We thank you for the assurance that we will hear to our prayer. And as we leave this home, this worship hall, O oh Lord, we shall surely be filled of the Holy Spirit Amen. to guide us throughout the day. In Jesus' holy and mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Excuse me, can I have the clicker? And then let's see. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All my life in this Adventist Church, a Seventh-day Adventist Church, SDA. And I've been hearing from the outside of the church people saying about us, sit down always people, SDA. Because our church is committee church. All the decisions we make through committees, and committees are long. Sit down always. And I met one of the Presbyterian church members. He was a pastor, and he converted to our church. And he said this, Pastor, SDA I would describe as silent, dead Adventist. Silent is good, but if our calmness and silence because of our death condition is not good, I want to listen to the voice of amen in this congregation. Would you say amen? Amen. 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 Louder. Amen. amen. Little louder. Amen. Amen is the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In the book of Revelation, the spirit and the vision of Jesus, it says that Jesus is Amen. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. His name is Amen. 
Don't be afraid of saying amen in the church congregation. Yesterday on the way going back to the campus, he is am, the singers of the thousand MMI, we had a talk about this campus. And only one thing we mentioned, pastor, as you preach, our hearts were, you know, inspired, so touched much, so we responded, amen, amen, from that side, but only we are the one who said amen. Nobody said amen. So this morning, I'm encouraging my church, PIC of AUP, please respond to the speakers. It's not because I am preaching. Whosoever preaching on this pulpit, as you agree with the message of God, please respond with the sound of? Amen. Sound of? Amen. Because we are lifting his name high above, because he is the only king who is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. Amen? Amen. 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 This morning is the second part of the book of Exodus, the final Exodus. And a lady asked me, Pastor, what is the title of this morning? I said, Foolishness in the Extreme. And you need to understand what it means. All right. Yesterday, we saw a king rose in Egypt who didn't want to recognize the, all the things had done by Prime Minister Joseph. He was a servant of Satan because he wanted to destroy all the nation of Israel, the people of Israel. Through that, somehow, he wanted to disconnect the family line of Jesus Christ. But in this critical time, Moses was born, a little baby, hopeless baby, by the slavery family. But God has somehow protected him. We know the story. And the princess Hasesop, according to the Egypt history, she was able to save this little boy from the water of the Nile. And he was adapted as, he, as her own son. And he was named by her, Moses. And his life was changed. And I told, we have this particular power game between God and Satan. Good and evil, righteous and unrighteous, holy and unholy. And so often time, our young people think that tough guy, Satan is much stronger than Jesus, but that's not true. Our God is much stronger and we were proven yesterday. And this morning, I want you to think about this lady, Moses' mother, hopeless mother, helpless. That's why she was giving up her own son to the Nile. You just imagine the, the pain she had. As a mother, can you just give up your son to the Nile River? With tears, and she pleaded, Lord, please listen to me. My baby is in your hand. Please take care of him. And now, I want to read this Christian mother's role. The whole future life of Moses, the great mission which he fulfilled as the leader of Israel, testifies to the importance of the work of the Christian mother. There is no other work that can equal this to a very great extent. The mother holds in her own hands the destiny of her children. She is dealing with developing minds and characters, working not alone for time, but for eternity. So this morning, I want to challenge my young people, especially the ladies. You are so beautiful, and you are great. And this morning, as a father, I am giving my spiritual advice. When you look for someone, please do not try to find somebody tough guy, rich guy, handsome guy, or tall guy, very much educated, prominent, good job. It's good. But before you see those 
specifications. Please try to see the heart of a man, whether he is a godly, whether he is faithful, whether he is kind, generous, and thoughtful. If you want to have a rich life, if you want to have a luxurious life, you may have handsome and rich men. But remember, those people can be always good to many other ladies too. So try to find someone who is very, very faithful to you, mostly to God. Because if a man fears the Lord and humble himself to the sight of God, he knows how to handle all other people. That must be your first, first thing to look for. Okay, now let us see how Moses lived in the palace. As you know, that the Jochebed, the mother of Moses, took her son by the grace of God, and for 12 years she was able to educate his, her own son according to the God's law. So, for 12 years, day by day, mother taught a Christian way how to serve the Lord, how to obey the commands of God, and finally, at the age of 12, he was driven to the palace. And we have a curious curiosity about the life of Moses in palace. Now, this is the message. At the court of Pharaoh, Moses received the highest civil and military training. The monarch had determined to make his adopted grandson his successor on the throne. And the youth was educated for high station. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Acts 7.22. You have to remember this verse. Moses was, what? Able to perform all the ways. He had many PhDs. He knew about the law. He knew about the administration. He was the general commander of the military. And he was everything. And he learned all the areas of academics. And he got the degrees. And he was the highest in wisdom and knowledge. And he was a strong. And he's a good man. Now, then what happened to him? His ability as a military leader made him a favorite with the armies of Egypt. And he was generally regarded as a remarkable character. I love this one. Moses was a remarkable character. He was strong and handsome. Now he is the prince of the kingdom. And the king already assigned, you will be on the throne after me. So he was announced as the what? Successor of the throne. Man, even the young, young people, the soldiers, they respected him, you know. General, manage. They serve him with their whole heart. But now, so the Satan had been defeated in his purpose. The very decree commanding and condemning the Hebrew children to death and had been overruled by God for the training and education of the future leader of his people. Here again, we see the power game between Satan and God. Satan, he wants to destroy the Messiah family line by killing Moses and his people. But you know, as I've told you, uh, Satan is a creature, but Jesus is the creator. He got one third of an angelic host from heaven, but still Jesus has two thirds of his army. So you have a clear understanding which way you should stand on. You will be this side or that side, evil side or righteous side, Satan's side or Jesus' side. Of course, we have to choose Jesus' side. Okay, now, 
Moses by the laws of Egypt or who occupy the throne of the pharaohs must become members of the priestly caste. In other words, Moses had to learn all the religious rituals and ordinations, ordinances. And he had to memorize many of, you know, what, ritual words. And plus all the procedures, how to worship those many gods. And Moses, as the heir apparent, was to be in initiated into the mysteries of the national religion. This duty was committed to the priest. But while he was an ardent and a tiring student, untiring student, he could not be induced to uh, participate in the worship of the gods. He was threatened with the laws of the crown. You please take a note this. He was, Moses was threatened with the laws of the crown and warned that he would be disowned by the princess should he persist in his adherence to the Hebrew faith. He was warned and threatened by his own mother. And the mother said, Son, if you continually disobey and disregard our religion and our practice, no more, I will tell the father and you cannot become a king. But Moses, in this power game, he chose God's side. Look at this. But Moses was unshaken in his determination to render homage to none save the one God, the maker of heaven and earth. He reasoned with priests and worshipers, showing the folly of their superstitious venera veneration of a senseless object. Moses argued, why do you worship those many images and idols? I do not understand. We made it with this silver and gold and stone and wood what they are. Why should we bow down and worship these images? It's ridiculous. I do not do this. I worship God the Creator. Let me tell you this. In Korea, I had visited uh, the, our West Central Korean Conference headquarters. It was located in the center of uh, Seoul City. Then one day, I realized that Actually, in front of our WCKC headquarters, there was a big, very well-known uh, Buddhist temple. We called the Joge Temple. All the national Buddhist, you know, the Buddhism activities and ordinances were done in that particular area. In front of that temple, all the streets, the shops are selling, you know, the Buddhist-related items like a monk's hat and, you know, the bags and the old, all those items. And uh, in front of the, the center of big shop, there are many, 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 many images of Buddhas, small to very big, huge, like a giant mountain. And it is about second story height. And you will see there in front of this temple, Big shop, fully, you know, the window opened, and everybody, they can see, you know, the, this big image of Buddha. The one day, I realized this middle size of Buddha were sold to one of the temples in Korea, and now they are replacing even bigger Buddha, golden Buddha image. And as I come out of the WCKC, going back to my home, and I saw something strange. Because I always saw the Buddha's assembled one. Never saw it, up, you know, actually apart from each other. It was carried by big truck, two trucks. And the first one was a big head. And the second part was the body trunk. And the third party, the one big trunk itself is a 
you know, this sitting posture of Buddha, the down bottom. So it was divided into three items, and now they, op they removed this big window, glass, and now they are putting one by one. You know what? I was standing there and watching over this for an hour. You just imagine, big bottom, these two, you know, folded, the bottom was moved first. About 20 of them would, you know, putting the cranes and, you know, moving slowly, slowly, slowly. And finally, it was almost touched the ground. And they put, the, you know, kind of rollers down there. And about 20 of them, they pushed one by one very slowly. Hey, be careful. And finally, it, you know, adjusted and finally come into the shop. And they placed and they took the roll one by one out. The next body trunk. Again, the crane hold it, and you know, I came in. The very next one is head. The third one, and finally it moved. As they put these three items together, they put around and going around. They, you know, there was little scratches like that. They painted, and finally they said, you know what, after this, all of them, about 20 of the workers and the drivers and all the workers, they sat down and Not only one times, over and over again. And at, on the streets, you know, I just knew to the shop, I was watching over this. Hmm. Big golden Buddha, God, carried by human beings, divided by into three pieces, assembled, touched, and now worshipped by those carriers. I want you to think about this. Think about this. They put the golden colors. Of course, it's not pure gold. You know, it's about four or five meters, very tall one. You just imagine the price. Now, Moses, he argued about this. How come we have frog, fish, and the wolf in the, you know, so many gods. So now he is telling them, no, this is not the one. By the way, in his age 40, he became the prominent leader, and now he's about to go on to the throne. But one day he saw the Egyptian person, you know, persecuted the, his own Hebrew people. So in the secret area, he punched him and he killed one Egyptian soldier. And he hid him in the sand. The next day, it was reported. And it was reported to the king. And now, the life of Moses threatened. So now this princess, prince of Egypt, he is running away to the wilderness Midian. Now let's look at the simple life of Moses in the wilderness, how he lived. You just imagine his life in the wilderness. He was surrounded many soldiers and maids and servants of the palace, and he was the top over there. Only one person higher than was the King Pharaoh. He was the everything, and he was super. But now he became one of shepherds in the wilderness, walking around and carrying all the sheep. Now, shut by the bulwarks of the mountains, Moses was alone with God. The magnificent temples of Egypt no longer impressed his mind with their superstition and false food. In the solemn grandeur of the everlasting hills, he beheld the majesty of the Most High. And in contrast, realized how powerless and insignificant were the gods of Egypt. Everywhere the cre Creator's name was written, Moses seemed to stand in his presence and to be overshadowed by his power. Moses became humble. Here his pride and self-sufficiency were swept away. 
in the stone simplicity of his wilderness life, the results of the ease and luxur luxury of Egypt disappeared. Moses became patient, reverent, and humble, very meek, above all the men which were upon the face of the earth, yet strong in faith in the mighty God of Jacob. It is very natural in the palace because everybody, what, follows him. They bow down to him. Although he learned at the meekness and humility from mother's side, but 28 years life in the palace somehow made him boastful, arrogant, and prideful. But in the life of the wilderness, somehow all those unnecessary character gone away, and he became patient and reverent and humble and very meek. These characters you and I have to learn. And one day, he took his ship and going to this way and that way, and something strange he was seeing. That was the burning bush. Burning bush. And as he approached, he is listening to a sound. Take off your sandals. Take off your sandals. What does it mean? Humility and reverence should characterize the deportment of all who come into the presence of God. In the name of Jesus, we may come before him with confidence, but we must not approach him with the boldness of presumption, as though he were on a level with ourselves. There are those who address the great and well, all-powerful and holy God, who dwelt in the light unapproachable, as they would address an equal or even an inferior. That's why yesterday in the afternoon I described the heavenly worship, how the angelic host, the four living creatures, above all the cherubim and the cherubim, these four living creatures with their six wings, they close their, they cover their faces and they cover their feet expressing their humility to the holiness of God and flying around and over the throne of God and continually give the praises, holy, holy, holy. So my friends, as Jesus is standing in this very place and as you come into this sanctuary, somehow unspoken words should be recognized by your heart. Take of your shoes. Take of your sandals. You don't, you know, necessarily literally put off your shoes, but somehow in your heart, you have to have a humble mind as you come into this presence. Why? Because simply our God is here. I want you to see this picture. Burning bush. Do you know the meaning of this burning bush? Was it just an image by God, you know, only that time to Moses alone? No. It, give, it gives a very significant meaning. Burning bush. The bush itself, you and I. In the wilderness, so many bushes are here and there. We are just one of the trees. But when Jesus is coming and falling upon us with the holy fire, because of his love, because of his forgiving grace, he is not consuming us because he loves us very much. Although you and I now sitting here with all unholy and wicked and evil imaginations and plans in our hearts, which Jesus Christ sees, in our inner heart. Yet, our God is so patient, slow to anger, and holding us with his glorious burning fire, yet we are not fully consumed. Why? 
because it is fully because of God's love. Whenever I look at the, you know, the burning bush, I must be consumed and destroyed and disappeared. My being as a burning bush, this, you know, leaves and branches and roots, trunks should be all gone. But because of my divine Lord's grace and forgiveness, I'm still alive and God's glory burning fire within me and above and beneath and around is still shining the light of Jesus to other people. Now I'm preaching, but I'm humbled. As I preach this, man, I'm a sinner. And my life to the sight of God would be also recognized as a sinner but saved by grace of God. Saved by grace of God. That is the most important image of this burning bush, you and I. My friend, he now talks to Moses. Moses, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard their crying sound. I am concerned about their situation, their suffering. So I'm coming down and to rescue them, to bring them out of the land. And now Israel has reached me and I have seen their sufferings. You know, our God is hearing God. Our God is a sensing God. Our God is seeing us. He knows your suffering and my agonies, my burden and our agendas. And He is coming and He is trying to rescue us from the burdens. And Jesus said to Moses, but you know what? I already know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand to strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. So finally, with this mission, now Moses is moving. But before he, he, he was standing in front of God, as he listened to his old stories, and Moses was stumbled, and he is now replying back to, Moses, uh, to Jesus with these excuses. Number one. Exodus 3, 11 said, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And he is adding now, What is his name? If they ask me, what shall I tell them? What is your name? God, I do not know. And for one said, What if they do not believe me or listen to me? All the way from me, the United, but if they listen to me, what is my function? And he's excused again, I have never been eloquent. I'm slow of speech and tongue. You see, Acts 7.22 said he was good in what? Words and deed. But actually now he's excusing himself, Lord, I'm slow of speech and tongue. I do not speak well. And especially I left Egypt 40 years ago. I lost their language. I cannot speak. And he again excuse, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. I'm not able to go. Please find someone else. Isn't it your and my excuse always to the Lord if you are requested to do something, you know? And finally he said, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? I believe because of my poor speaking quality, Pharaoh won't be listening to me. But after all those excuses, God was angry with him and said, who created, who made your lips and mouth? By the way, you and I have to understand this. Moses' age. Moses' life, 120, is divided into three sections. The first 40 years in the palace. The next 40 years in the wilderness and the next 40 years in other wilderness, okay, all the way from Egypt to the land of Canaan with his own people. 
By the way, when he received this mission, he was already 80. But Psalm 9010, this was written by Moses himself, and it says, Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. You have to remember that Moses was 80 years old when he received this divine mission from the Lord. After he excused himself, you know, six different reasons, but after he was caught by God, finally accepted at the age of 80. In other words, he lived all the lifespan, the average lifespan, longevity in his time. But now at the age of 80, ready to go to the grave, but now he is now standing as a man of mission by the power of God. Now finally, he reached the king's own palace. You just imagine, 40 years ago, it was his own house. It was his own playground. It was his seat. You know, every corner, he would remind that I was there. I was there with my mother, with my king pharaoh, with my brother, someone, you know. All my military soldiers, they bow down to me and they salute to me. I know this place. Now he was standing there to the king of pharaoh. But now, as he said, but the king Pharaoh said, who is God? Why should I listen to him and he is not listening to him? So what he did in front of king Pharaoh, he threw his staff and the staff became snake. And all the magicians beside of king Pharaoh, ah, that what we could do. And all of them, you know, they threw the staff. And all those steps became snakes. Then King Pharaoh, <laughs> that simple magic, our magicians could do, but all of a sudden, Moses' staff, the snake, and just going around and all swallowed all the staff of the magicians. We already know the story. And the first plague, blood of the Nile River and all the streams of the waters. And magicians also did the same. Hey, it is simple. They're changing colors. That is ba very basic magic. And they got the water and they changed the color. But the next one is the frogs. Frogs came out of the Nile. So many frogs are jumping here and there, you know. And the magicians said, ha, ah, that is simple. Changing the image we could do. And they did. And the number three, nuts. With the staff, actually, uh, Moses hit the dust of the ground. And all the dust became the nuts and fly away and stick to the people. And the magician now, with their staff, now they're hitting. Ooh. But this time, God stopped them. You see, sometimes God allows Satan to do miracles. But you and I have to know that a certain level God allowed, but from certain level God never, never allows. So from the first, it's only God performed the miracles. And the swarms of flies and plague on the livestock and the boils on the man and hail and locust and the darkness and the finally the death of the firstborn male. We already know these 10 plagues which had taken in the land of Egypt. But now, as you go through this, you and I have to understand why God performed this and why God distinguished the land and the people through these many plagues. You just imagine the water became flood, a blood, and many people were suffering and the animals were killed, and what? The big hills came down from heaven, and also low coast swept away, and finally, the firstborn male, from animal and to the family, all the human beings were killed. 
that now we have to understand why these things were happening. Why do I told you about the false gods, the images? And actually this you have to know. The blood, the Apis, the Nile god, Isis, the Nile goddess, and the Knum, the Nile guardian, the frogs, Hecate, the frog-headed goddess of the birth and fertility, Nes, Set, the god of the desert, flies, Uchit, Uachit, like the fly god, and the livestock, female cow goddess Hathor, and the bull god Apis, and the bulls, god over health and the disease, Shekmeth and Snu, Hail, Nut, the sky goddess, Osiris, the god for the crop of fertility, and Seth, the storm god, Locust, Nut, Osiris, and Seth, and darkness, the sun god Ra. Or rare, and the firstborn death, Osiris, the god of afterlife, death, life, and the resurrection. Okay, this is the family tree of the Egyptian gods. Not only one, but many, many, many gods. And they are siblings and husbands and wives and children, you know. <laughs> Somehow, Egyptians believe that God has a family, and they have a different functions and the powers upon it. These are the gods, the image. Now, if you go to Egypt, in the National Museum, they have all of these. Horus, Osiris, and Isis, or Isis. I think you have seen this image, right? And now, Osiris, god of the afterlife, death, life, and resurrection. Ra, the sun god. And how about the Isis, the goddess of health, marriage and wisdom. Horus, god of the sky and kingship. That's why they bow down to the sky. Oh, we need the rain, we need the wind, we need this and that. They always worship those gods. Nut, goddess of the sky, stars, sun, moon, light, heaven, astronomy, universe, air, and the winds. Knum, the god of creation and the waters. Not only that, Apis, god of strength and fertility, and Hathor, goddess of love and fertility. Do you remember that Aaron, the Moses brother, as Moses went up to the Mount Sinai and spending 40 days and night there, you know, in the, uh, by the understanding of the human beings, Moses cannot survive on the Rocky Mountain for 40 days. No water, no food. That's why they thought, oh, Moses is dead. We need to have our own God and go back to the land of Egypt. That's why Aaron made this golden calf, the image of Apis or Hathor. Hathor, goddess of love, fertility, women, motherhood, and mo music and dance. You see, Horus and everywhere, if you go to now Egypt, you will see all those images. They were their gods. Even in the papyrus and on the walls of the, you know, the, the tombs, the Hecate, the frog-headed goddess. You see there? You see those? And the Anubis, the wolf in the desert. They worshipped insects, fish, animals, and the star, moon, and everything. That's why so many false gods, they worshiping. That's why God said, oh, no. Unless they knew that all those false gods, whether it's a small or big, whether it's a significant to the life or not, God is now controlling. They are nothing. They are powerless. They have no ability to control or guide or bless you. That's why God is destroying one by one by the plagues. And the Egyptian people, they want to depend on their beliefs. By the mouth of the Egyptian magicians, they declared, this is the finger of God. After they hit the you know, dust over and over again, they could not perform the same miracle that Moses and Aaron did. Now this time they said, no, this is the finger of God. 
I will deal differently with the land of Goshen and my people. God distinctively distinguished the land of normal Egyptian and the Goshen, where the people of Israel were there. So my friends, God is powerful. And now, the Satan's strategies, and you and I have to learn this. You know, after the, all the plagues took place, and now the last one, and he's continually, you know, getting punches from the Lord. You are not able to fight against God. Now, he's now, what? Telling the Moses, okay, 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 okay. <sighs> Go and sacrifice to your God here in this land. He's now trying to what? Try to persuade. Okay. Your winner, I lost. But would you stay here? The next one is, okay, you must go, but not very far. I allow you to go, but not very far. But now this time, okay, you go, but only men go. Your children and your wives, no. Only for three days you, you guys go and worship and come back. Satan wants to seize, capture our beloved ones so that we may not fully devote to the Lord. And the last, okay, you go, man and woman and children, all of you go, but please leave your flocks and herd behind. In other words, you go without money, your possessions, your reputations, your houses, and all things you leave behind, you go. But because of these idols and love, I know you will come back. Do you remember the last story after Sodom and Gomorrah fell down by the fire of the Lord? The last wife was going ahead toward the mountain, but you know, on the way she was so loving items in, in the city. So she was turning her head and she became a pillar of salt. My friends, according to the Christian statistics, if the children going to church and trusting the Lord, believing God, 3% of them are able to remain their faith in the lifetime. But if mothers are with them and bringing them to the church together, 14% of them are able to keep their faith. But if father, if father are worshiping together with his wife and the children, you know what? 93% of the people are able to keep their faith. Amen? Amen? That's why I'm telling you, you faithful and godly woman. Oh, Adventist Church, we have not many good men, not much of educated, because about 70% of the church members are ladies. That's why, the, you know, the, this ratio between man and woman, you are lack, always lacking. That's why I said, oh, okay, how about I may look for a good man, very handsome and rich and educated, good job, and if I be faithful, then he will become our church member. Then he's good. It is a mission. But I tell you, only about 14%. This is the general study of the Christian, Christian society. Only about 14% of the ladies, women, were able to keep their faith. So try to look for somebody, making from 14% to 93, that is matching with godly men. Of course, you guys also same. You guys also same. So this morning, as I conclude my sermon, I you to like, Think about this, sorry. Actually, I prepared a little more, but I want you to uh, remember this. Uh, yeah, appealing song, would you please be ready? Again, I want to conclude this. You heard the story of now chapter two and three, okay? Tomorrow we'll depart. By the way, all the 10 plagues and clear distinction between the land and the people Egyptian and Israelite, Goshen and the general, you know, the Egypt area. 
God was able to protect, not only protect, but he could conquer all the false gods in Egypt. To the mind of Egyptians, they worship everything. If they feel that they need of something, they just bow down and worship, making all the frogs and the fish only this and that. And they said, this is my God. It will bless me. But my friends, this morning once again, I'd like to lift up our Messiah, Creator, our beloved Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? Because He is the Creator against a creature. And He has a powerful army of God, the angelic host, two-thirds of the whole universe, while Satan has only one-third. That's why continually I urge you to choose the righteousness of God, powerful God and almighty God. Although you have idols of money, maybe some of your idols of games and, you know, internet and sex or what, degrees and positions, this morning I urge you, think about yourself. How many your personal small false gods you have in heart? Rather this morning you will choose. Break all those falsehood of the gods from your heart and choose the God of creation, mighty God who is able to not only protect but guide you to the land of Canaan. That is my desire this morning for my beloved students of AUP. God bless you. The Lord revealed to us the signs of His coming. There'll be false cries, wars, and famines, earthquakes, and pestilence. Many will be persecuted, hated, and betrayed. From this we will know that is coming. To the edge, keep watch, be not deceived. You who endured to the edge will be saved. Be watch, strengthen your faith.
the Creator God. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us how to worship you, how to trust in you, how to depend on you, so that we could be saved in the arms of God. This morning we learned the old the story of Moses before he is bringing out his people out of Egypt. So Lord, now let us ponder and meditate the message throughout the day, how we can come out of this cage, out of this land of darkness. Father, please bless each and every one of the students of AUP as they study, going to the classes, and building a good friendship with one another. Your love and your blessings shall be upon with all our faculties and students today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Keep watch, be not deceived.